she told me the story about the master sergeant. The master sergeant was on a transport plane and he came in and he was having coffee with June and some other people and he was very visibly upset. And he said that last night he had flown in from New Mexico with wreckage and bodies. This was one of those statements where it was immediately misconstrued. Everybody at the table thought that they were talking about an Air Force plane mm -hmm. and that maybe the bodies were bodies of someone that they knew. Mm -hmm. And finally, this master sergeant, he realized that nobody was getting it. And he said, you don't understand. They're not human. Welcome back. I'm here again with James Clarkson. James, welcome back to the show. Ah, pleasure to be here. Okay. So today you have another book. It's about June Crane. Who is June Crane? Well, initially, of course, I had never met her until 1993. Mm -hmm. Now, following along, I was a detective sergeant with the Aberdeen, Washington Police Department. At that time, I was courting the woman who became my wife. She was the children's librarian. And as I mentioned in the first episode, I met her when I carried out this box of Bigfoot items to her car. And I saw that she had UFO books. That's how we ended up dating, because I had a common ground, something I was excited about that we could talk about. So. One thing that all librarians want is to get people into the library so they have programs. And getting teenage boys and adult males into the library is difficult unless mm -hmm. you pick the right subject. Well, mm -hmm. Bigfoot was extremely popular. What they would put out, they were having a free Bigfoot program, they get a lot of people. So after Joanne put up with me for a while, hearing about UFOs and watching UFO videos and me showing her the newest book that I was excited about. She said, you know, why don't you do a program on UFOs? And of course, the Timberland Regional Library System covers a big portion of Southwest Washington, and they have multiple libraries. So I started getting these speaking gigs. and. Actually, there were several times when I'm really glad that the fire marshal did not know how many people we crammed into this little library building to hear me talk about UFOs. And of course, many times to have people share their stories. Mm -hmm. Well, in 1993, I was invited to do a program in Ocean Shores, Washington, which is on the other arm of Grays Harbor from Westport where the Westport crash event took place. So I gave my UFO lecture to a group of about 30 some odd people. Afterwards, a very stern looking elderly woman approached me. She was well dressed, well spoken, but very firm and direct. She kind of came off as the elderly lady that everybody was a little intimidated by, and she enjoyed mm -hmm being that kind of person. And she said, you're right. The government knows all about UFOs and they're keeping it a secret. And I said, well, how do you know? And she said, because I worked there. And I went, whoa. And I could tell she wasn't making this up. I mean, you just having been a policeman for quite a while then, you kind of get a feel for who's on the level and who isn't. Yeah, you were a detective. I mean, it was your right. occupation to vet people. Right. Yeah, that's part of my whole life. So I said, tell me more. And she said, I can't. They'll come and arrest me. And I think that part of the way she said it, the way she looked at me, she was kind of worried that I would arrest her because I did not make it a secret 
that I was a police officer, a detective sergeant. When the United States and China clash, the world will never be the same, especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene. What if the United States went to war with the People's Republic of China? How would these rivals fight for supremacy on land, sea, air, and across the stochastic streams of time? What wonder weapons would be unleashed? What horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the South China Sea? What heroes would rise and forever change the course of history? Tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse, gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities, and bear witness to the disturbing visions of World War III from today's greatest minds in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Weird World War, China. Available now from Bain Books at Bain.com. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, would always tell people, you know, what I'm about to talk to you about is not an official statement of the Aberdeen Police Department. These are my personal beliefs and opinions and statements. They have nothing to do with anything official, but it adds to your credibility as a speaker. Well, she kind of backed away from me. And so I said, well, if you ever change your mind, I gave her my business card mm -hmm. and I had her name. And I did some checking after that. Now, this is 1993. It's important to remember the year because mm -hmm. she never opened up to me until four years later. That's how long she had held that secret since 1953. What Roughly I, how old was she when she met you? She was approaching 70. She was right like 70, 71 or so. And she'd had quite a life. Mm -hmm. So four years go by. Lots of things that happened in my life. I get a phone call out of the blue with no warning. Now we're in 1997. And I need to put this in context. March 13th of 1997 was the Phoenix Lights which I believe is one of the most important UFO sightings that ever occurred. And I think the secret keepers also thought it was very important. That one had to be put down at all costs. It also was the 50th anniversary of the Roswell UFO crash later on in July, which mm -hmm. I believe broke all records for attendance perhaps only rivaled by the 2022 75th anniversary, which I was one of the speakers in Roswell. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that a lot of people turned out. I was at the UFO Museum. 12,000 people came through the front door of the UFO Museum in Roswell in three days. And the, the streets were just packed everywhere. I think we talked to at least half of those 12,000. But getting back to 1997, mm -hmm. the phone rings, I pick it up, and it's June's voice. And she says, it's a damn lie. I said, well, how are you, June? <laughs> and what are we talking about? She said, have you been watching CNN? Well, I had. And there was a news story, which of course got covered by every network that the Air Force had just issued this new book, Roswell Case Closed. And they went on and on about it was Project Mogul, a top secret balloon project. And the dummies were dropped by parachute, were test dummies, and people thought that they were aliens. And that's how the whole crashed saucer and alien bodies thing got started. So, of course, that doesn't stand up to any scrutiny. Yeah, I don't know where I heard this, but I think they didn't have those kind of testing. Not until they didn't do that testing until at least like 53 or so. In fact, yeah, I, yeah, that's I what it interviewed was. Yeah. 
the officer who was in charge of the test dummy parachute program, and he was angry. He was retired by the time I talked to him. He was angry that they had used his work that he was very proud of as an explanation for Roswell. To advertise on Through a Glass Darkly, email ads at gmail.com. He felt that he had been kind of misused and mocked. And in fact, I ended up sending him a copy of my book on June Crane that I eventually wrote, and he sent me a bunch of material. I sent him an article, that's right, that I had written. It was a synopsis of what I was going to get. Later on, I stayed in touch with him. Well, so June tells me she's angry, and then she says... I want you to know the balloon story is the same one that we used when I worked there. And I said, what do you mean there? And she says, I worked in laboratories at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. It turned out that June worked at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base three times between 1942 and 1952. One time her employment was broken by illness. Another time it was broken by pregnancy. The only reason that she left was that along the way, she ended up marrying one of the security police and his enlistment was up and he moved away and wanted her to come with him with the baby. She did not want to leave. She was extremely proud of the work that she did for the U.S. Air Force. Now, of course, bearing in mind that when she started in 1942, there was no such thing as the U.S. Air Force. Right. It was created in 1947. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's hilarious because along the way, I eventually got June's papers and some of her routine correspondence that she had kept, you know, job promotions, tests, that kind of thing. They didn't even have the new stationery. So they had these forms that said War Department and Army Air Corps and all that, and they X'd them out on the old typewriter and typed in United States Air Force. And Department of Defense. And Department of Defense, exactly. So June said, we used to use the balloon story when people would send in reports about UFOs. She said, this is all old. And I said, you're willing to talk to me now. You weren't willing to talk to me four years ago. And that's when she made a statement I will never forget. She said, I'm 72 years old. I've outlived two husbands and my cancer is in remission. What are they going to do? Shoot me or put me in prison? Well, I was thinking about this as I was kind of gearing up to have this discussion with you. And I realized that I do believe there are certain things that happen to us that are synchronistic. It's almost like you're meant to go through them and you're meant to go through them at a particular time and not to go into too much personal stuff. But this was one of the times in my life when Joanne and I were broken up. We got together, broke up, got together, broke up, and finally, thankfully, we got together and stayed together. Probably, it's really all because of my afterburn from a divorce. So the point being, I wasn't seeing anybody. I had a lot of free time when I wasn't on duty. So when June called me up like that, I said, how soon can I be at your house? Because I wanted to know more. This was a fascinating story. I initially wanted to just interview her because she said that she helped type these routine responses 
that they would give when people would send the Air Force a UFO report. So I arranged to go to her house, and it turned out she was a night owl. And I was pretty much a night owl, too, at that point. So I would go, we would sit up late and drink coffee and swap life stories. Now, I admit, June and I became friends. She also became an important witness because it turned out that she really did work for Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. She really did work in top secret laboratories. And she had a lot of interesting stories to tell me about the difference between how they talk about UFOs in a top secret environment and what they tell the public. Those are two entirely different things. And you got to put this in a framework in order to work in an office like that, June was a civilian employee, but her direct supervisor was a full bird colonel. Mm -hmm. And one of her main responsibilities was to be in charge of safes, like 10 safes, literally, that all had different combinations that contained top secret information. And her job was to make sure that when people would work on files, that the person who had the right security clearance and the right assignment got the right information. And then at the end of the day, it had to all be resecured. This sounds very cumbersome, and it was. But see, there were no computers back then. Right. There were no personal computers, so people are not typing on keyboards with a screen up in front of them. These are manual typewriters. In fact, the environment that she worked in was so restricted that at night, they had to take the typewriter ribbon out of the typewriter, and that had to be secured to the safe. You could not leave any paper on your desk when you went home. It had to be under lock and key because they were so worried about espionage during World War II and afterwards from the Soviets. So it was a very real fear. Mm -hmm. One thing that I learned as a detective, in any organization, if you want to know what's really going on and you're doing an investigation, you want to make friends with the administrative secretary because they can tell you more about what is really going on, usually than even the boss. And they, if they like you, you will get everything. If they don't like you, you won't get much of anything. Mm -hmm. And June basically, although they could only call her a clerk because that was her official title and she got promoted as time went by, she worked in a top secret environment. She had to have the same security clearance as the scientists and military officers because she was handling top secret material directly. For instance, Project Caucasian. She told me that every time they did anything about Project Caucasian, her boss would like turn pale because he was so worried about the security aspects of this project. What on earth was Project Caucasian? Well, see, that was my question, too. <laughs> when I first heard about it, nobody knew. I contacted military historians, all kinds of people, and got nowhere with that. Now, you got to put all this in another framework. I got together with June, and she started telling me things in the summer of 1997. June died about a year later. Do you think I that don't was think, I don't think her... Her cancer was not really in remission that much. Mm -hmm. And she was a very strong-willed person, and she basically pushed it off. And I think that telling me her story was part of what she considered her kind of last obligation. Mm -hmm. 
So I got everything I could from her during those times that we were together. She finally consented to let me tape record her. And in fact, the book I wrote, the central part of the book is a transcript of that interview. I hired an off-duty prosecutor's office secretary, and she did the transcription from the audio tape. Well, June told me a number of things that are highly important to the whole UFO subject. After she died, in about 2000, Project Caucasian was officially declassified. Up until then, it remained a top secret project. Project Caucasian was the code name for the project to construct a parachute harness for a hydrogen bomb to be dropped out of the back of a B-36 bomber. So obviously, it would have been anything to do with the A-bomb or the H-bomb would be under the highest levels of security. June gave me all this information, and if I could verify it, I did. So in other words, I also acted as an investigator. I tried to see what of the things that she told me could be verified and what things could not. Now, unfortunately, like most UFO stories, the really good stuff I don't have completely verified. But mm -hmm. she was a qualified witness. She was in the right place at the right time with the right security clearance to have known the things that she told me. And qualifying a witness is another extremely important part of the process, both as an investigator and eventually if they testify in court. You have to be able to demonstrate that the witness could have seen or heard or done the things that they are testifying to. How did you independently verify this stuff, You'd get the documentation and all that? Well, part of it was I contacted the National Records Center in St. Louis, and that was kind of fun because it took me four or five tries. They kept saying they couldn't find her file. We can't verify any of this. You need to contact the Air Force. I would contact those agencies. They would tell me no civilian employee her record is in st louis and finally one day out of the blue i got a big envelope and no cover letter but it had all of her records photocopied and i had probably about a third of those documents anyway because june gave me the originals mm -hmm. i have one of her first pay vouchers from 1942 that actually says War Department on the top and the whole bit and her evaluations and, you know, various personnel documents along the way. So to make a long story short or shorter, by the time she left employment in 1953, 52, 53, she knew she had heard about three UFO crash retrievals. Not one, not just Roswell, but two more. Now, she wasn't sure of the locations of the other two, and that's kind of intriguing to try and speculate. It could have been Kingman, Arizona is a possibility. Aztec, New Mexico is another possibility. There are several other candidates. She knew one of the pilots, well, part of the crew of a military transport plane. These people would come and go. She gave me a old, old Polaroid photo of this group of test pilots. She was involved in laboratories that were doing advanced parachute research. Mm -hmm. So she knew the engineers and the scientists directly who were involved in parachute research. She kept saying, Kanaki wrote the book on parachutes. And I couldn't figure out what she meant until after she died. And that was a strange story, too, about how I got that information. 
but it turned out that Walter Kanaki was one of the Project Paperclip scientists who was brought over to the United States after World War II. And this man was a technical wizard on the subject of parachutes. Now, how do you spell his name? K N A C K E. Okay. I don't know how you pronounce that exactly, but it was Walter Kanaki. And he knew everything about parachutes. For instance, the problem was, how do you take heavy payloads like actual vehicles and drop them by parachute onto a combat area mm -hmm. and have them still be intact and usable when they hit the ground? Now, there's a lot of engineering that goes into that right down to the air friction on the cords that support the shoe. This man was heavily involved in that research. June knew all the right names. She told me the story about the master sergeant. The master sergeant was on a transport plane and he came in and he was having coffee with June and some other people and he was very visibly upset. And he said that last night he had flown in from New Mexico with wreckage and bodies. This was one of those statements where it was immediately misconstrued. Everybody at the table thought that they were talking about an Air Force plane mm -hmm. and that maybe the bodies were bodies of someone that they knew. Mm -hmm. And finally, this master sergeant, he realized that nobody was getting it. And he said, you don't understand. They're not human. And he described them briefly that they were, you know, child sized, big heads, strange hands. Their skin had an odd color. That one got my attention. And then one of the best stories is that this kind of sums up June's position in the office. Everybody had to go through her to get this top secret information. And she was the only woman who worked there. And she's a young, attractive lady. And men flirt. And an officer came into her office and sat on the corner of the desk one day and said, hey, June, you're a good worker. Let me show you something. And he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out this piece of metal. And it's about the same size as a business card. This is the memory metal. This is the mm -hmm. holy grail of ufology. The metal weighed nothing. It was light as a feather. This officer said, June, take those scissors. Cut it up. Do something to it. She couldn't poke a hole in it. She couldn't crease it. She couldn't cut it. It was completely impervious to the scissors. She wanted it up into a ball, and it sprang back to its original shape with no wrinkles or any visible change in it. Well, June described all these things, and I kind of kidded her a little bit during the interview. I said, oh, come on, June. You know, that's 50 years ago. You've seen modern plastics and all kinds of things since then. And she basically put me back in my place and she said, you don't understand. I've never seen anything like that again. Well, she was trying to cut this metal in her office. And all at once, somebody else started to walk through the area. And this officer grabbed the metal and stuck it in his pocket. So she says, what is that? And he bends down to her and he says, it's a piece of a spaceship. She says, oh, what is it really? He says, it's a piece of a spaceship. And then he leaves. Because he wasn't supposed to have it. And he certainly mm -hmm. wasn't supposed to be showing it off to other people. So all of these stories fit together. You know, that's why I describe June as a key corroborating witness 
to Roswell and these other events. And I'm not alone in this, although I thought I was initially. Now, you got to bear in mind that during all these events, I was rotated back from investigations back to being a patrol sergeant. That's what our department did. They, of course, the administrators go off to school. They come back and they decide they need to do something new and trendy. So we're going to rotate everybody. So one day I'm detective sergeant and the next day I'm a patrol sergeant. I was not happy about that, but that's another story. Well, I was sitting in a. Well, I mean, isn't it isn't it effectively a demotion? I mean, I know they weren't. Well, intending I thought to do it that, was, but they of course claimed that it wasn't because right. they, I would take my vast expertise out onto the street to help the other officers. It wasn't like I was unavailable to them anyway. This was only a thirty-six officer department. If somebody wanted my help or to consult with me, I was always available. Yeah, that's like the argument for cross training. But I, it sure was everybody can do every job. Not my favorite development. Right. Well, a few sometime later, we move forward to 1998. I should point out that the way that it went was that June got really ill again in 1998, and my last conversation with her was in a hospice over in Hoquiam, Washington. And she's a very, very direct person, very honest. And along the way, she had, out of the blue, surprised me. Several months after I got to know her, when she gave me her personal papers, she let me do an audio tape of her. I got a letter from her attorney. I was really surprised. And I opened it up, and it was an affidavit signed and notarized that said that she was giving me the rights to her life story. Oh, wow. This was in, in her gratitude for my friendship when she needed it most. Well, I kind of needed her friendship then, too, because I was at a crossroads in my life. So moving forward to her passing on in hospice, the last conversation I had with her, I said, June, what do you want me to do? And she looked at me and she said, Jim, tell my story. So when it came time to write a book about her, I called it Tell My Story, June Crane, the Air Force, and UFOs. I have faithfully kept my promise with that book through podcasts like this, through lectures that I've given everywhere, because her story is important. She was an ordinary person, hardworking, didn't have the greatest breaks in life, and she was very proud of her service to the U.S. Air Force, very patriotic. I've actually sent copies of this book to India, and I'm very proud to say that it's also been translated into French. <laughs> So it makes sense. You gave a lecture, right? Yes. It's actually available in, well, back then it wasn't available in French, but it's available through Flying Saucer Press over in Europe. But back to me, this is after June has passed away. I'm a patrol sergeant. I'm sitting in a patrol car. It's a Sunday night. It was some off night and it had snowed. There was nothing going on in town. So I turned the AM radio on in the car, and Art Bell was on. Mm -hmm. I listened to Art Bell, like many others did. He interviewed some very important people in this field. And that night, they had Dr. Bob Wood and Ryan Wood were on there talking about the majestic documents. And I had never heard of them before. And I thought, this is fascinating. So they gave an 800 number. Now you can go on the internet and you can get all of them. You can just download them or read them whenever you want. But back then, that wasn't true. So I called the 800 number the next day and I said, I want to get the documents. And I said, by the way, I said, I don't know if you can help me, but 
I'm a patrol sergeant in the Pacific Northwest, and I have this story from this woman who worked at Wright Patterson Air Force Base who talked about crashed UFOs and alien bodies, and I don't know what to do with this information. I got a call back from a travel agent, wanted to know if I could fly down to Newport Beach in California for a meeting. And it turned out they were paying. And I said, well, I usually don't go anywhere without my wife. And they said, well, what does she do? And I said, well, she's a librarian and she has two master's degrees. And they said, fine, we'll make her a research consultant. So they flew us both round trip down to Newport Beach. And we were picked up and taken to this high-end Hyatt Resort. And I meet Bob Wood and Ryan Wood, and I was there for this special meeting. I get into this meeting, and here are all these people whose books I had on my shelf. Linda Moulton Howe was there. Paul Davids was there. There was Jim Mars back when he, obviously, he's passed on now. Stanton Friedman was supposed to be there, but he couldn't make it, as I recall. And there was actually a man who is one of the heroes of this field, and he's always working behind the scenes, Dr. Hal Putoff. Mm -hmm. And he was there. And during what happened in the next couple of days, each of us was tasked with giving a presentation about what we knew about the UFO field. This was fascinating. Small group setting. I was in kind of in awe. And you could ask questions, free conversation back and forth. And I was just blown away. And Linda Howe passed around this weird medal that she had gotten from Art Bell. It had been mailed in by an unknown person. Mm -hmm. And this is the metal. You may have heard about it. It has multiple layers of bismuth and magnesium. And when I held it, I think very clearly this was manufactured. But the problem is, according to Linda Howe, and nobody knows who made this or why. So... I thought about it that night. It kind of disturbed my sleep because I thought maybe I got to hold a piece of something that was made by intelligent, non-human beings from somewhere else. And that really creeped me out. And I mentioned that the next day when I was giving my presentation and Linda Howe and a couple of the others started laughing. And I would thought, well, are they laughing at me? And they said, no, 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 we're not laughing at you. And Linda looked at me and she said, welcome to our world. We live with this reality all the time. And that's when it all began to tumble to me that there is this whole other world of understanding that certain people have that go about things that are going on all of the time around us and that have gone on in the past. And most of the public is unaware of it. So there are two groups, the secret keepers and the rest of us. We're kind of the unruly rabble that they would like to dismiss because we're disorganized and rebellious but we keep coming back at them and we won't go away because we're determined to tell the stories of people like June Crane and others and not let them go because our history is so complex and rich and important. I still believe if I can in some small way contribute to this field, I think that getting the human race to realize that we are not alone and that we are not necessarily the top of the heap, that there may be something more 
than us that's visiting us. I think that that's really important. So they took up the story from June. In fact, while I was there, Al Putoff said, what's your address? He was kind of cryptic about it. I gave him my address. A few weeks later, I get a plain brown envelope in the mail. And inside, there is an extract from an obscure magazine in the Air Force. And there's a technical article in there about parachute construction written mm -hmm. by Walter Kanaki. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is, the next article in the same periodical was written by Dr. Lincoln La Paz, who is one of the people, in fact, many people believe that if there is a secret Roswell report, an actual like a accident or incident report, that he wrote it. We know for a fact that he was assigned to investigate the mysterious green fireball phenomena that occurred around all of the most sensitive installations in the Southwest back in the 50s and 60s. So the fact that here I've got Walter Kanaki's article on dropping heavy payloads on a battlefield next to an article by Lincoln La Paz in this very obscure Air Force publication. This is gold. That's exactly what June was talking about. I could tell readily when she said Kanaki wrote the book on parachutes, she was spot on. And see, there's so many things like that, like her telling me about Project Caucasian, all these details she gave me. She thinks that she met Dr. Werner von Braun, but there's no record of him being at Wright-Patterson. And, you know, she's the one who told me that. When I first met her, she was trying to get information on Werner von Braun's biography. I've looked in two or three biographies, and I can never tie him to Wright-Patterson. The reason that's important, June claimed that one night she was ordered to stay after hours. She was met by an officer who was wearing a sidearm. She remembered that that he was armed with a pistol. She was escorted to a secure compound on the base, and she was told that she had to take dictation from a man who had very cold eyes. He had a very thick German accent, and she said she honestly believes that it was Werner von Braun. The letter involved writing an application for funding to Congress for what would become the United States space program. She said he had very cold eyes and she had to stay there a long time. And when they were all done with the transcription, her duties as a stenographer, the officer said, June, if we get the money from Congress, you will have had a hand in creating the space program for the United States, for our rocketry research. And every time June would tell me that story, she would get tears in her eyes. Because one of her biggest regrets in life was that she had to leave her job to follow her husband. Because that's what women did in the 50s. Right. So women were not independent, respected as professionals. So she did what she had to do. And the irony was she ended up following him to a couple different places. They lived in Portland, Oregon. On their 10th wedding anniversary, they had been having a lot of marital trouble. He went out front to put new license tabs on the car license plates. They were going to go out for the evening. She had one child. His son was just a small boy. He was out there with his daddy helping to put these tabs on the car. A drunk driver came around the corner and rear-ended the car 
and sandwiched him. He sustained injuries that killed him. His last act was to shove the boy out of the way so that the boy was not injured. He died in the hospital the next day. Well, June tells me this story. It's very dramatic. I went back and looked up the files of the Portland newspaper, and sure enough, I got the article. It went down just like June described it to me. This is just one more thing. She told me other things that I initially did not want to include in the book. She said that in 1975, she went to a party in Portland, Oregon, where they could see out over the river, the Columbia River, and they saw a large classic metallic UFO come by in the sky. Well, I wasn't really sure what to do with this story. I couldn't verify it anywhere. It wasn't in MUFON. It wasn't in New Fork. So initially, I didn't include it. Well, that all changed a few years later because I got called by a federal agent. And the federal agent had looked me up on the internet and he wanted to report his own UFO sighting. I want to make sure I get the date right. July 2nd, 2014, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, an on-duty federal agent who worked for one of the three-letter agencies, I won't tell you which one, and I won't tell you his name, I never told MUFON. They determined this to be one of the 10 best cases for the year. He observed a classic flying saucer in the sky over downtown Vancouver, Washington. Perfect visibility. I met this man several times. We exchanged numerous emails. He actually showed up at a UFO conference down in McMinnville, kind of out of the blue. He was just there. And my wife and I got to go have coffee with him. He's kind of the poster boy for what we hope all of our federal agents would be. He's young, in the prime of health, etc. He sees this thing go across the sky and he's doing the mental checklist. No wings, no jet engines, no propellers. He can see it bank slightly and see the reflection off the side. Well, he's telling me this story and he says, that's not the weird part. I said, well, what's the weird part? He said, it looked like when it was about two-thirds of the way across the sky, like there was a line drawn in the air. And as this saucer crossed the line, you couldn't see it anymore. Mm. There was a ripple, in time. a ripple, and then it's gone. Either it cloaked or it took a shortcut. And it was leaving the area. So he's standing there looking up in the sky thinking, well, this has got to be the weirdest thing that ever happened to me. And here comes an F-15 on afterburners from the Portland International Airport, which, by the way, that's one of the locations where they keep armed F-15s ready to go at all times. So it's not inconceivable. It goes roaring across the sky in the same direction as this flying saucer that he had just seen. So this had only happened a few days before. So I contacted a friend of mine who's also involved in UFO research, and he is a retired NOAA weatherman. Mm -hmm. So he knows all about radar. So... I actually coughed up 200 bucks because they don't give it away anymore. That's largely because of UFO researchers. I contacted the FAA and I got the radar data. He unpacked it and put it on a map. And we put the location of the witness, the probable path of the UFO, and what he found. There was a spot, an area near where we think that this UFO disappeared in the sky. There were two or three passes of the radar 
where it got solid returns from something that had no transponder. This means if it was a civilian or a military aircraft, it was doing something highly illegal. Mm -hmm. You have to have an operating transponder. Well, the inference would be that somehow when this thing in the sky was transitioning from being visible to either being gone or being invisible, it was temporarily on the radar. So I add all those things together. I have a man with excellent powers of observation on a clear day observes the UFO that appears to be a solid object. It does not appear to be any known aircraft. It does something extraordinary that can't be duplicated by any known technology. And we confirmed that the thing, something was there mysteriously on the radar very briefly. I would say it couldn't get any better than that unless I had the UFO on a trailer and I brought it in and showed it to people. So at that point, I thought, you know, June's story doesn't really sound so far fetched. And oddly enough, I've had two or three other unrelated reports from the Vancouver, Washington area of people seeing very strange, classic UFOs. It appears to me something may be coming and going from the water, if I had to guess. Mm -hmm. And God knows that's another whole field we don't even want to get into. It would take forever undersea or underwater UFOs. But off the top of my head, that's the June Crane story. Did she ever tell you why or maybe even speculate why they keep keeping this thing secret? Like, what's this thing they're so worried about? Well, she never went that far, but she did make the comment that she was of the opinion that the real purpose of Project Blue Book, as she put it, was to convince the American people that only nuts see flying saucers. June had a very direct, down-to-earth way of speaking. Yeah, that's clearly, I mean, that's probably what Arrow is too, right? Well, I think Arrow is more of a flypaper operation to get scientists and military personnel who shouldn't be talking about this, talking about it, and then they got you. Well, David Shindelli, who lives up here in Puget Sound, he is a former missile command officer who was there when UFOs shut down, I believe it's Minot Air Force Base back in the mm -hmm. mid-60s. And he tried dealing with Arrow. And their method of interviewing him made him furious. And he wrote, oh, I wish I had that letter in front of me. It was just scathing. When he wrote back, he just burned them to the ground with how badly he had been treated. If they treated all their witnesses like that, I understand. Yeah, Bob Salas was not happy either. He was at Malmstrom, and he also interviewed with them. And it was almost, they were just going through the motions, right? Oh, they are. It wasn't serious, right. Well, the other thing is, even if we assume for a moment that the aero personnel were tasked with doing a real interview, one, they did not possess the security clearances that would be required to interview anybody who worked for a company that was involved in retroengineering alien technology. So the people in those companies couldn't possibly answer their questions. And two, they didn't have federal agent authority. They couldn't compel people to testify. And obviously, when you get federal agent authority, if you either obstruct or refuse, they'll put the habeas grabus on you and take you away in handcuffs. So not having that kind of authority, 
They could not do their jobs. In other words, Sean Kirkpatrick is like a police chief in a small town who tells his officers they can't leave the police station and you can't arrest anybody. And then he runs around bragging about how there's no crime. Well, of course there's no crime. Nobody walked in the door and confessed. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's a shame. So, do you think these people are ever going to disclose the government? Oh, after having been at this for 40 years, first off, the pattern is always two steps forward and one step back. And I'm just as guilty as everybody else. I get excited when David Grush testified. I thought, wow, this is it. It's finally going to happen. But we keep pushing and we edge forward. Two steps forward, one step back. They're trying to keep the lid on this thing and it's not working. And the White Hats have come out of the shadows a bit. That's why we got that thing, the To the Stars Academy with Tom DeLong. Have you ever looked at the people who were the board of directors? Not specifically the board of director, but directors, but the people associated with it, right? There's Hal Putoff, the, the, there's the, the, Jim Simeon. The consulting directors of the To the Stars Academy, between them, they've got about 250 years of experience and education in the intelligence field and science, the biologic sciences, medicine, advanced research, quantum mechanics, you name it, as well as the three-letter CIA is sprinkled rather liberally throughout that whole bunch. Mm -hmm. These people were not dragged out of the Pentagon by a former rock star, Tom DeLong, who bravely marched into the hallways and got these people to come out into the open and testify. No, 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 no. They created an organization where they could start to disclose and where whoever was behind the scenes had plausible deniability. Right. That's what it was all about. If it went sideways, they could walk away. Yeah, you could just burn it. Right. I had a brief meeting. I wished I could have talked to him for hours. I got to meet Lou Elizondo. He was sitting two tables down from me during the 75th anniversary celebration at the Roswell Museum. And I really, really enjoyed meeting him, talking to him. And he told me, because I initially was a little confrontational. And he said, you got to understand, there are white hats and there are black hats. And there are things that I can tell you and things that I can't tell you. And he said, you have to just trust that I'm one of the white hats. And I think that he is. And I think he doesn't want to be arrested for violating a non-disclosure agreement, just like David Grush doesn't want to be. So they're walking a tightrope to tell us things. And people don't appreciate that. Oh, I didn't, they should just tell us yeah, everything. No. It's well, really you're easy. Not, you're not. Yeah, hey, they, they should just go to prison for the rest of their lives. I mean, why aren't they willing to go to prison for this? It's just like, exactly. are you willing to go to prison for this? Yeah, it's yeah. I always say, what have you done? You know, right. what risks have you taken to promote this field? Do you have the courage of your convictions? So I once had somebody at a UFO meeting. I think he was a little high. But he started accusing me because he knew that I had a police background. In fact, I was still an officer then. It was a MUFON meeting. And he said that I was obviously a government plant, and I was this and I was that. And I happened to have a copy of a newspaper because I had been to a two-day UFO conference in Bellevue, and I made the comment to a local news reporter how ridiculous the news coverage had been because they did the usual media thing. They went right. to the conference, they found the craziest person in the room, and they quoted them at length. Mm -hmm. 
They didn't talk about the fact that most of the speakers had PhDs, master's degrees, that they were highly experienced in various professional fields. They never mentioned that. So I had the newspaper man, obviously, seeing the possibility, said, well, can I write an article about you? And I said, yeah, providing that you don't link it with the police department. You can say that I'm a policeman, but you cannot say that this is official. So they did. And being a small town, I actually was the headline story. And they was something like, UFOs are this cop's hobby. Well, I happened to have that paper when this idiot was accusing me of being a government plant. So I pulled the paper out, showed it to everybody, and I said, well, for a government plant, I'm not doing a very good job at keeping right. it a secret. So, and that's when I said to him, I said, what have you done for the field? Have you taken any risks? Have you stood up? Have you done what Stanton Friedman always said? He said, never be an apologist, ufologist. I don't apologize for this. I'm proud of it. I got to meet Stanton Friedman. We have the McMinnville, Oregon UFO Festival every year. Mm -hmm. And it is tremendous. And I've inherited the job of being the master of ceremonies now, which I really love. Because then I get to run around with all the speakers and, you know, I get a chance to really meet them and get to know them. That's pretty exciting. And we're going to a huge ghost conference at the end of this week in Seaside, Oregon. So that's going to be a tremendous opportunity to tell yeah, more we ghost stories. Yeah, I think all this stuff seems to be merging, right? The paranormal. It is. And I think that's part of the reason why a lot of this stuff hasn't made a ton of inroads, because there's these aspects of high strangeness that if people told the you know full story it would be much easier for the government or whoever's trying to hide the secret to keep the secret by saying oh well you know that obviously can't be true so right anyway. the public is easily deceived yeah all right my friend it was an absolute pleasure talking to you and people should pick up both books which i'll have in the description below Excellent. And we'll you know, definitely talk soon at some point. Absolutely. So thank you, James. Well, thank you, Sean. Thank you, James. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe. And also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now, and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than giving me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon. And just go to either site and it'll explain everything. third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you could get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and you can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel. And I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link. The channel gets a cut of that, and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates Club. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because 
it's more of a expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, there's two options. There's Buy Me A Coffee, which is a separate site. And there's also, you can go through YouTube with either a super chat, a super sticker, or a super thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me A Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you, you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.